We're here again with GU Oncology today, and we're at um, ASCO GU 2024, and we have a lot of exciting data to discuss. We'll uh, actually start out by maybe just talking about, of course, what everyone talks about, which is EV302, and uh, the tremendous difference that this study has made. So maybe I'll just open it up by um, asking, well, I think we, we would all probably agree that most patients or ma many patients would be eligible for this regimen. Um, which patients in particular maybe would you consider for something else other than the, uh, other than the EV302 regimen, which is important of adult and pembrolizumab? I think that's a great question. And I think in the U.S. at least where there is access to pembrolizumab and fortumab, and now we have a regular approval with this regimen, I think the vast majority of patients will probably get pembrolizumab in the frontline setting. The question is how many patients may not be able to tolerate and fortumab adult and open prolizumab in this setting. I think it depends on where you are. In academic centers, there is some selection bias of patients who are more fit to travel and go there versus real world community oncologists where we may have more frail patients in some areas. I would estimate that about 10% of patients in my practice may not be that fit for enfortumab because of peripheral neuropathy, grade two or higher, maybe questions about liver disease, child pup score B or higher, Patients maybe with uncontrolled diabetes and high obesity, it's a risk-benefit discussion with the patient. And obviously there's no any clear-cut guideline, but I think should be informed and shared decision-making. But I think for the vast majority of patients, I think Pembroke V, I think is a new standard of care in advanced urothelial carcinoma in the front line. Yeah, yeah, I would completely agree. I mean, the data looks so strong for the EV302 trial. We saw basically a doubling of median OS. We saw a doubling of the PFS. 30% complete response rate. You know, we never saw those numbers in bladder cancer. And so when I talk to community doctors and when I talk to patients, I really try and emphasize how groundbreaking this data is and really try and get patients to that treatment. I think as you say, Dr. Grievous, you know, peripheral neuropathy is an issue. If patients have grade two or above, we really shouldn't be giving them EV. If they have um, severe diabetes, that's a, a contraindication. There's been ketoacidosis reported. And really, when I, when I go out and talk to community doctors, I really emphasize that we have to know the side effects of these agents and really think hard before starting patients. As eager as I am to get somebody on this regimen, I really worry about severe rash, severe peripheral neuropathy, hyperglycemia. And so I think it's really important that we're counseling our patients and our staff you know, and our colleagues to really understand this. And a quick question. If you yeah. have a patient or any of you who has an active autoimmune disease, let's say on steroids, and you may be you know, challenged with pembrolizumab, what do you do? Do you do platinum chemotherapy, EV monotherapy? What do you do with those patients? Well, that's a great question. So I think there's been a lot of trials and there are now prospective trials actually enrolling patients with a history of autoimmune disease onto immunotherapy trials, which is great for those patients. I think in general, in my practice, as long as they're not on an immunosuppressant, I, if they have a history of autoimmune disease that's well controlled, especially if I have a good rapport, let's say with the rheumatologist or the whoever else is managing the autoimmune disease, I would consider giving those patients immunotherapy because some retrospective studies have shown that those patients actually don't always experience a flare of their autoimmune disease. And they may be at a bit of a higher risk of immune-related adverse events, but generally can be managed with steroids. Thank you, Karen. It's a great discussion. And I think we're all learning you know, from those patients. It depends right, on what condition we talk about. Like myasthenia gravis now is different than psoriasis 10 years ago. So very different scenarios. Right, point. active immunosuppression versus a history of mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis. I, I might think of those patients very differently. Yeah. But certainly would exercise caution on using IO in patients, unselected patients who are actively on steroids, for example. I think you have to be very careful because I think probably all of us can, can think of patients who've had um, adverse events related to that. So we just want to be, be cautious. Absolutely. But in general, I think for um, over the time that we've used immunotherapy-based regimens, right, which is now almost close to a decade, right, if you consider, you know, clinical trials that led to those, the approval of those drugs, I think, you know, a lot of oncologists have become more comfortable, especially giving it to, to patients, even with, you know, baseline autoimmune conditions. Uh, but that is, that is an excellent question.